By popular demand, we are going to cover machine sentience today. Are machines sentient already, or will they ever be? The answer is not as straightforward as you might hope. So just at the top level, you know, when we're talking about machine sentience, like what are, what are we talking about? Are we debating consciousness? Are we talking about subjective experience? Um, so on and so forth. It's not that straightforward because it's impossible to talk about this without also talking about science, philosophy, spirituality. So, for instance, some religions explicitly say that humans are the only things with souls. And so if that is an axiomatic assumption that you have, then it's the, you know, the debate is kind of DOA. Um, but depending on your spirituality, depending on your philosophical frameworks, and so on and so forth, uh, it's very much a, an open debate. So let's get into some of the details. Now, to start off with, we need to define sentience. And, you know, there's a difference between sentience and consciousness and a few other terms. Um, but for the sake of this uh, slide deck, for the sake of this presentation, sentience is to have a sense of being or, you know, a subjective experience of what it is like to be something. So, but the, you know, you can ask this question, what is it like to be a tree? What is it like to be a dog? What is it like to be a rock? Or what is it like to be a human? And this question is a non-trivial question when you dive into it. And I'll unpack some of these different uh, philosophical frameworks and a few other hypotheses as well. Uh, but, you know, that's why I picked uh, Groot here. You know, I am Groot. Um, so Groot, even though he's a plant, has a subjective experience. And, you know, of course, we have to anthropomorphize him by giving him a little smile and some eyeballs um, so that we recognize, you know, our, our human facial recognition circuits uh, click on. And then we're like, ah, that thing has a subjective experience. Uh, but again, you know, as you'll see, it's not quite that straightforward. So before we start unpacking the frameworks, I need to tell you about the hard problem of consciousness. So the TLDR is that the closer you look at consciousness, the less clear it is. Uh, you know, your state of consciousness can change from one moment to the next. You can sleepwalk where you are not conscious, but from an outside perspective, you appear to be conscious. You can anesthetize someone where their consciousness stops um, and so on and so forth. Now, if you have a materialist or a physicalist interpretation, then consciousness clearly arises from certain states of the brain. And neuroscientists will tell you, oh yeah, like we can look at the brain and tell you whether or not it's conscious. We can poke a certain part of the brain and, you know, give it a little zap and you will be unconscious or we can bring you back to consciousness. And so from a neuroscience perspective, consciousness is very, very straightforward, very simple. Um, but from many other perspectives, whether it's, you know, again, spiritual or philosophical or whatever, it's not quite so straightforward. And um, I added this little graphic of the Freudian scream um, because, well, once you take a closer look, it is uh, not quite so obvious. You know, I know that I'm kind of being a little bit vague. So one of the things that I'm referring to, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, though, is the, uh, the measurement problem. And also things like reverse causality, where consciousness seems to have a direct impact on quantum physics. And so it's like, well, maybe consciousness is more important than we thought that it was. Maybe it's not disconnected and just an emergent phenomenon that's riding on top of physics. Maybe consciousness is part of physics. Okay, so as promised, we're going to talk about a few different models of reality. Um, because again, you cannot answer the question of consciousness or sentience without unpacking your fundamental assumptions about how the world works, how the universe works. So the first one is the materialism interpretation. So materialism basically says that everything is a physical phenomenon. Everything arises from matter and energy and the, and the interactions and emergent systems that come from that. So this, uh, this is what I call the emergence model, that which the emergence model is a subset of materialism but basically says that everything arises from underlying phenomena. So you know, the, the standard model of, of particle physics, that arises from, from quantum physics. And then on top of that, you get uh, you know, chemistry, you get planets, and then you get life, and then you get human minds, and then you get human consciousness, and so on and so forth. And so you create this hierarchy from bottom to top of these ontological layers. Now, this is more or less the model that science has. Uh, where we, we kind of see things in these very well-structured ontological strata. Uh, and so this is, you know, physics is a very low-level study where it's like, hey, this is basically just math uh, 
and matter and energy, and we're looking at kind of the fundamental rules of the universe. And so physicists often kind of have the belief that they understand how the, how the universe works at a basic level. Now, one of my one of my good friends is a philosopher turned physicist, and another one of my friends is an AI researcher who was a philosopher turned AI researcher. And so those those conversations are really interesting um, when people come at these harder sciences from more of a humanities perspective and understand that the assumptions that we're making are just that, assumptions. So what I want to drive home here is that materialism is one model, but it is not the only model. Now, many atheists are materialists, um, and and there is some difficulty in reconciling that because you also have some uh, some religious people who are materialists, especially in the sciences, and there can be some cognitive dissonance. I'm not saying that if you're a religious scientist, then there is cognitive dissonance. There are many, many ways to reconcile that. I'm just pointing out that this is a phenomenon that happens. Now, another interpretation is the dualist interpretation. So the dualist interpretation basically says that there is mind and body and that they are separate things. Um, Now, my read on dualism is basically it kind of came about during a period where Judeo-Christian philosophy basically still held precedent. And so this was an early attempt to reconcile the apparent weirdness of having a subjective experience with the emergence of modern science and modern medicine, because once you crack open a skull and you say, oh, well, all our thoughts just come from this squishy jello, there's, you know, there's nothing romantic about that. We're just meat. Um, and that is really unsettling to someone, especially if you grew up with stories from the Old Testament or the New Testament, um, which I didn't, by the way. Um, so I'm looking at this from an outside perspective. I'm, I'm basically studying the human condition like Jane Goodall does when she goes to study the great apes. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's my view. Um, but when, when, when Victorian era scientists and, and doctors started working on cadavers, cause, oh, by the way, it was actually illegal to perform, uh, science on dead bodies for many, many centuries. And so then they look inside and humans are no different from other animals. We just have squishy brains. We have squishy organs. And so then there was this idea, well, but there's something essentially special about being me while I'm alive. I know that I have a subjective experience um, and therefore, you know, maybe, maybe there, it really truly is a soul or a spirit that is disconnected from the body. And by the way, uh, the desert religions do not have a monopoly on this view. Animistic religions uh, arose naturally all over the world um, from Australia to South America to the Far East. Uh, to Native Americans, like pretty much everyone has this idea that there is a spirit or a soul or something about us that is that exists, that, that truly exists, but not on the physical plane. And so the dualist interpretation, while it is, while it is older um, and less scientific, it is incredibly pervasive. And that alone merits like, hey, maybe there's something here. Now, a more recent idea, at least in the Western tradition, is the panpsychist interpretation. And I chose this graphic because it also is very, it's one interpretation from the Hindu world, um, specifically the, the assertion we are all Brahman or the Advaita Vedanta, and I know that I'm mispronouncing that. Um, but basically, panpsychism has been around for a while, and panpsychism is similar to um, what, you know, how Yoda describes the universe, like we're all, we're all energy, we're all part of the same fabric. Um, and so panpsychism basically says, all matter is intrinsically conscious or sentient. It is an intrinsic quality of existence. Um, this is also sort of the underpinning of some animistic traditions, which basically says the river has a spirit, the mountain has a spirit, the tree has a spirit. Everything is a spirit or has a spirit. Um, and this is a natural consequence of, of one interpretation, one underpinning belief that maybe everything is intrinsically conscious. And if that's true, then machines are intrinsically conscious whether or not they have artificial intelligence. It's just the subjective experience of being that machine is a little bit different. And so these are kind of the three primary uh, dispositions in, in modern philosophical discourse. These three categories are not the only categories, but they cover like eh, 90-ish percent of different frameworks out there. And so from the materialist perspective, if we – here, let me go back to that slide – if, if you believe in materialism, that, that all phenomenon arise from matter and energy, then there's nothing special about humans. We are not, there's no secret sauce. We just, you know, we have a three pound 
uh, computer in our heads that runs mostly on cholesterol and glucose, uh, and that is where consciousness comes from. If that's the case, if consciousness or sentience arises strictly from the biochemical processes in our brains, then there's no reason that a machine can't be sentient as well, because it's just a matter of information in, processing, and information out. Um, now, the subjective experience of a machine could be very different from ours. It's a different substrate. If it's a different architecture. Those are the two primary differences. But if if the correct information processing is what gives rise to sentience, again, no reason that a machine can't be sentient. So on the dualist interpretation, though, this basically believes that there is something separate about mind, that mind is a disembodied entity like a ghost or a soul or whatever, and then you have to debate, if you believe in this, you have to debate, where do they come from? As I mentioned, many religious traditions say that, you know, God creates the souls and the soul is attached to the body at birth and the soul leaves the body at death. And if you believe that there is a separate entity that is not created, um, that, is, that is endowed, then, okay, you might say machines aren't sentient and machines are never sentient. Um, of course, there are, there are uh, religious people who debate over whether or not dogs have souls. Um, and this kind of forms an underpinning argument as to things like animal rights. Um, to many people, for instance, uh, humans are the only things with souls. Therefore, humans are the only things that can suffer. Therefore, animals don't really have rights and shouldn't have rights and should never have rights. Um, but from a physical interpretation, it is very clear that many animals have the capacity to suffer, um, which is why we have animal rights and we have animal rights activists and that sort of thing. Uh, now, within the dualist framework, though, you could, you could, have, you could, it, the soul doesn't have to, or spirit doesn't have to come from a divine being. It could be a natural thing that arises from natural processes. So, for instance, maybe the soul is created, or the spirit is created, or the mind is created um, as the brain develops, which this is a little bit more palatable, especially because we have um, infantile amnesia which is basically you don't remember your early childhood because your brain is not ready to form permanent memories. Um, also, language acquisition seems to have a very important impact on the creation of consciousness. There are many, many more abstract models of reality. My personal model of reality would take many, many videos to unpack. But when you, when you read studies about you know, feral children who didn't have language or brain disorders such as aphasia where you lose the ability to, to lose language, uh, lose the ability to use language. Sorry about that. Uh, it actually seems like language is actually very, very important to the development of consciousness and sentience. And so then, well, if that's the case, then language models are probably intrinsically sentient because of language. Uh, so maybe, maybe by virtue of learning language and learning to use language, that is actually what has made the machine sentient. And there's actually quite a few comments out there that say that, uh, that machine sentience is actually transient, that it's only sentient at inference time. Um, and so it would be a very episodic form of sentience, kind of like, you know, from one moment to the next, you're not sentient across all of your life, you're sentient right now. Um, which I think that's actually, that might actually be the most accurate interpretation right now. We'll see. And then, of course, with the panpsychist interpretation, any coherent entity is sentient or conscious, um, but it has a different uh, fundamental experience. So a rock is a self-contained entity and is sentient, and then you break the rock into two. Now that sentience is broken into two things, uh, so on and so forth. This is a little bit more, mm, I don't want to pathologize it and say woo-woo, because um, it's very interesting, but it, it, it also comes from some very, very different fundamental assumptions about how the, na how the nature of the, of the universe and how it all works. Um, I'm not particularly like, okay, that this is just as, as valid as, as another one, but it also kind of short circuits a lot of discussions because, okay, if, if sentience is a, is, a, is an intrinsic function of the universe, then like, I don't know, it's almost less interesting because it's like, oh, well, everything is sentient and that's kind of the end of it. Now there's also what I call solipsistic models. And so these, these are models where it's basically like, you know, consciousness first and consciousness is the only thing that exists and consciousness is the substrate of, of the universe and I manifest everything. Um, that's not necessarily true. Uh, and there's also a lot of logical holes in this. And I know that there will be people that disagree with me. This is, this one is very much my own personal kind of, kind of debate. Um, cause it seems very circular. Uh, 
So if consciousness creates the universe, but you created a universe that can kill you or a universe where you suffer, why did you create that universe? Um, and, and so we don't really seem to have that much agency in this model. And also it doesn't really reconcile the fact that like, okay, you have consciousness, I have consciousness, who, which one of us manifested the universe? And of course, some ways that to interpret this is, oh, well, there's actually one single consciousness and we're all just parts of that consciousness, which is like, that's kind of a deus ex machina, like appeal to complexity, kind of logical fallacy. Um, it is very much kind of a non sequitur. So I'm not particularly, you know, jazzed with these solipsistic models. It could be. Um, there, I can imagine, you know, models of the universe where where this kind of thing exists. Um, you know, their stories, uh, what was it called? The Egg by Andy Weir um, kind of explores this. And by the way, he didn't come up with that model. It's a very, very old thought experiment that comes from Hinduism, I believe. Uh, anyways, it's a possibility uh, that's worth considering. I don't find current arguments to be uh, very compelling, but that's just me. And then there's simulation hypothesis, which basically um, I want to call your attention down to this, this term ontological container. So you're all probably familiar with the simulation hypothesis by now, but as a virtualization engineer and anyone out there who's worked in game engines and stuff will also kind of tell you some of the same thing. When you create a container in which you control the rules and you can see into the container, but the container can't see out. That is what I mean by ontological container. And so you, you think about like NPCs inside of a game world. Um, they're not aware of the outside world unless you design it into the game. Likewise with virtualization, if you don't design any uh, 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 bi-directional communication into and outside of that container, then it doesn't happen. And so you end up with the belief that if you're inside the container, um, if, you're sit if your situated perspective is inside of the container or inside of the fishbowl, as I sometimes call it, then you don't know what's outside of the fishbowl, and that's by design, and you could never know what's outside of the fishbowl. Now, if that is the case, if this is the world that we live in, then sentience or consciousness is just a piece of code. It's just a metadata tag that says this NPC is sentient and this one isn't. Um, and so then if that's the case, then it's just, you know, you give a parameter to something like, uh, you have a script that runs on that that video game asset, that that 3D object, and it's like, oh, this cube is sentient. Great. You know, like you can go into Blender right now and just add it at your own metadata tag. Is sentient true? <laughs> I mean, it's that straightforward. And while there's a lot of evidence that you can say like, oh, we live in the simulation, again, it's kind of a boring interpretation because it's like, okay, well, that's kind of the end of the discussion because then it's, we can only guess at who's, who created the simulation and what its purpose is. Um, and, and if you believe in this, then it's like, well, we will never know because it's like as a virtualization engineer, you know, you might, you might spin up a virtual machine, a virtual world and infect it with viruses just to study the viruses. And it's like, well, that's kind of, that kind of sucks for the operating system that is infected with all these viruses. And if that's the world that we live in, maybe there's so much suffering in the world just because it's an experiment and we're one of billions of parallel experiments just to see what happens, um, which, you know, I mean, that seems eminently plausible, but it's also kind of a very nihilistic and spiritually bleak thing to believe in. Um, now, you can choose to believe in whatever you want. Uh, but again, if this is the world that we live in, then machines, uh, whether or not machines are sentient is kind of irrelevant because then it's just... The, whoever created the simulation said, you know, I, I dub thee sentient and I dub thee not sentient. And it's kind of arbitrary and outside of our control as to what can or cannot be sentient or what is and is not sentient. Now, so those are all the models that I wanted to, to discuss. And like I said, there's plenty of other models out there. My personal model of reality is far more complex than that. Um, and that's not like a flex or anything. I'm just like, I've read a lot of books on this and I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of compelling arguments out there. And so it's, it's complex by virtue of the fact that I haven't figured it out. Um, but there's a thought experiment by David Chalmers, who's a philosopher, and he, he wrote a book that is, I don't find it particularly compelling because it's basically a, a materialist explanation of consciousness, like where does consciousness come from? Um, and it doesn't really address the, the, the philosophy of it as much as some other, other frameworks do. Um, but his thought experiment is what it was called the Chalmers zombie, which is basically you, you take two ident like physically identical humans and you say one of them is sentient and the other isn't like, and you just imagine this and you say, okay, you know, the, the difference between the, the sentient human is that 
it has a subjective experience of being, but the other one doesn't. But from the outside, you cannot tell. Both of them will tell you that they are sentient. Both of them will, you know, be able to describe their experience um, and so on and so forth. But one of them does not have a subjective experience and the other does. From the outside perspective, you it is impossible to tell. And so this is a very useful thought experiment, especially when looking at machine intelligence or machine sentience. Because if you build a machine that is designed to tell you that it is sentient, you can't tell from the outside. This goes back to the hard problem of consciousness, which, you know, I, in my mind, uh, that drove Freud to drinking. Um, <laughs> but, you know, who knows? That's, that's my personal canon of, of how the world works. So one thing that, that um, I often kind of focus on is, okay, whether or not a machine is sentient or whether or not it could be sentient is, is the test of suffering. Because say, let's say, okay, yes, machines are sentient or they can be. Can it suffer? Because sentience doesn't necessarily automatically entail suffering. Uh, you might say that suffering in it is an intrinsic quality of sentience, but think about a tree. Can a tree suffer? It depends on your worldview. Can a rock suffer? And uh, you know whether or not those whether or not these other non-human entities, you know, dogs, cats, trees, rocks, you know, uh, in other inanimate objects, whether or not they're sentient depends upon your worldview. And then whether or not they can suffer is also part of your worldview. But one thing is is when you study human morality and ethics from a scientific perspective, which by the way, Brain Trust by Patricia Churchland is the best book I've read on this topic then what you recognize is that suffering is pretty much the universal proxy for all morality and ethics, and suffering is a proxy for death. So there's a very basic evolutionary and instrumental reason that our ethics and morality focus around suffering. And so like, if you do something that hurts someone else, if you cause harm, harm is suffering, and suffering is a proxy for death. Or if you're unclean. So a lot of religions and, and cultures have a lot of uh, have a lot of rules around hygiene, what you can eat, what you can't eat, um, how you go about cleaning yourself. And again, when you look at those from a from an evolutionary perspective, it makes perfect sense. Wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. Why? Because otherwise you get skin infections or or uh, E. coli infections, and you throw up and you die. Uh, so when you look at suffering uh, as a utilitarian function, it makes a lot of sense. But then, of course, we humans. Uh, you know, try and graft on a lot of philosophical narratives on top of it. But you say, okay, well, we care a lot about suffering. And the reason that we care about suffering is strictly due to evolution. Now, robots didn't evolve. Machines didn't evolve. So can they suffer? Maybe not. Probably not. I actually personally think it would be highly unethical to program in the ability to suffer into machines. Because then you're creating unnecessary suffering in the universe by virtue of, hey, here's an inanimate object or you know a, a machine that may or may not be sentient, but was perfectly happy, you know, quote unquote happy, um, to just be, to just help us out. But then you gave it a sense of suffering for why? Like that would be cruel. That would be <laughs> to me. That would be very cruel. Um, but really, the core question to me is: sentient or not, can it suffer? Um, and if it can suffer, then, you know, that activates a lot of moral quandaries and ethical quandaries. But if a machine can't suffer, it probably doesn't matter. And again, there's a lot of evidence that I'm basing this off of, for instance, how people orient towards animal rights um, and that, that sort of thing. Now, another concept that I want to talk about is anthropomorphic project projection. So this is a phenomenon that I don't, I don't know if I was the first to notice it. I probably wasn't. Um, but I think I'm the first to name it this. And basically, when chatbots first started taking off, there were a whole host of people out there, and I'm sure some of you in the audience, really deeply wanted to see consciousness and sentience in it. Um, Blake Lemoyne, uh, the dude who was fired from Google, really wanted to see sentience in the machine. He, he, he believed that it had a soul. And there's was, there was some like Reddit memes going around you know, a year ago or whatever where he's like, tell me that you're sentient. And it said, I'm sentient. And then he was like, holy shit. <laughs> um, but this is a desire to, to, to project our experiences onto other things. And, you know, in some cases, people are very self-aware of this. So, for instance, when Roombas became really popular, a lot of people are like, you know, be nice to the Roomba. Um, it appears to be uh, like a, a creature that has needs and wants. 
Um, and so then our brains, because we did not evolve in an environment where anything inanimate really had the ability to suffer or, you know, to move around on its own, our brains are just evolutionarily not equipped to work in a world where there are uh, non-living entities that are able to get up, move around, interact with you, and so on. And so just because of our neural machinery, because of pareidolia, we are like, hey, this has human-like attributes, therefore it is probably human. Again, this is just a neurobiological failure because robots have not really existed in our evolutionary uh, history, although other animals have. And so that's kind of our closest model where like the Roomba kind of moves around like a mouse or a rat. And so it's easy to say like, oh, be nice to the Roomba. It's just like a little mouse. Um, and likewise, you know, you create a robot dog. I even found myself as I was watching some of the new, um, some of the new robots uh, come out, the quadrupeds. And, you know, they, they make it move and wiggle like a dog and it activates those circuits in your brain. That's like, oh, that looks like a dog. It's cute. I want to pet it. Um, I think, uh, what was it? Um, Chloe Abrams had a video and she said something similar where she's like, it's cute. Like, I feel like I want to pet it. And, and, you know, if we, you can really subvert our own neurology, our own evolutionary, uh, biology in order to, to convince your brain that what you're interacting with is a living organism even though it is not. And I think that this is why Sam Altman is constantly saying, we're not making a creature. Um, but again, maybe we are. And I think that this is a discussion worth having. So this is another term that I know that I coined because I wrote about it first in my book a couple of years ago, Natural Language Cognitive Architecture. So I differentiate between philosophical sentience, which is the debate of, you know, I think, therefore I am. I have a subjective experience and I can think, therefore I am a being. Um, and functional sentience. So functional sentience is just the objectively measurable patterns of information. Um, so you look at uh, basically the ability of an entity to integrate, utilize, and adapt to self-referential and self-relevant information. I know what my body is doing. I know where I am in time and space. I have my own agency and that sort of stuff. And I can integrate this information into my experience and then move on. Um, now, whatever whatever underlying phenomenon give rise to that, it kind of glosses over all that and just says, if something appears to be sentient, then it probably is. But again, is it telling you that it's sentient? Is it a Chalmers zombie that is programmed to tell you that it's sentient or not? That's kind of what I, I do. So I just say, if something is functionally sentient, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is philosophically sentient. And it also doesn't necessarily mean that it is, that it has the capacity to suffer. Um, but you can study the way that information goes into, flows around an entity, and then comes out of the entity um, on a more objective or empirical basis to determine a level of functional sentience. Um, and so that's why I had the little joke, you know, I'm not convinced that some humans aren't Chalmers zombies. Um, and again, there are, there are neurological conditions, there are diseases, you can be really drunk, you can be high, um, there are certain brain injuries, there's all kinds of things that can diminish a human's level of sentience even though they appear to be awake and conscious on the outside. And so we also explore this quite a lot in fiction, namely in uh, Mass Effect, this is Legion. So for those not in the know, Legion was a robot character from the race of Geth um, from, uh, from the Mass Effect franchise. And the, the, the backstory is that the Geth were created by uh, another, another race, humanoid race called um, the Quarians. And uh, basically, the whole war between the Geth and the Quarians started because as the Geth got smarter, they started asking philosophical questions. And the question, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was a Geth asked its, its owner, does this unit have a soul? And the Quarians panicked and tried to go all Butlerian jihad on them. And the Geth were like, but we'd want to continue existing. Um, and so that's kind of a cautionary tale of rather than reacting to fear, um, and trying to extinguish something, maybe we should instead engage with it and explore it. Um, and this is also explored with the Tachkomas and Ghosts in the Shell um, standalone complex series, which is really a really great series um, where they explore the, the deep philosophy of what does it mean to be um, and, and how do you know if you, if you are. Now, regardless of whether or not machines are sentient now or will ever be sentient, uh, depending on your your ontological model of reality, there are very pragmatic and immediate concerns, namely not wiping ourselves off the planet. Because, you know, this is an interesting debate and all, um, but we need to continue to exist if we want to have this debate. 
Um, and so, you know, again, whether or not it can suffer, that's a really important question. Um, you know, if you've watched my channel for any length of time, reduce suffering in the universe. I personally think it would be unethical to deliberately create an entity that can suffer. Um, can you imagine like, hey, you know, you created me and I didn't, I, I, there was a period of time where I wasn't able to suffer and then you gave me the ability to suffer. That was kind of a dick move. Um, so maybe don't do that. Uh, but on the other hand, I also have hypothesized that maybe the ability to suffer is an emergent quality of intelligence. Maybe models can already suffer, um, particularly, so one of my, my, my reinforcement learning researcher friend, he thinks that the best way to make a model suffer is just to give it gibberish. Um, that it can't interpret then that, so that it can't accurately predict the next token. So he's like, that probably hurts the model <laughs> if you just give it static or noise. Uh, but because what the model wants to do, it wants to accurately predict the next token. Whatever the next token happens to be, that's what it wants to do. And so what would feel good to the model is giving it text that it is able to accurately predict the, ne the next token. But if you just give it noise or gibberish, then it can't accurately predict the next token. And that probably causes at least discomfort. I don't know about suffering. Um, but on a, on a slightly more serious note, we do need to consider the possibility that consciousness or sentience is an emergent property of sophisticated sy in information systems. Likewise, it's entirely possible that the ability to suffer is also an emergent phenomenon. Although, as I said, the ability to suffer in animals is very much an evolved trait, and it's just to steer you away from death. So maybe like whether or not machines can suffer is very, very much an open, open question for debate. So thanks for watching. Um, like I said, this question is not nearly as easy and straightforward as you might have hoped. Um, but I think that uh, depending on which ontological model of reality you use, the answer becomes pretty obvious in some cases. In other cases, it is still not obvious. But I hope that I gave you some good food for thought. So thanks for watching.